We are here tonight to study the book of Acts, so I hope you're doing well this week, and I hope you can join me in Acts chapter 19. We're just partway into this chapter. I hope you can join me there in just a few minutes. As we get started, I want to remind you that we're getting together this coming Sunday for worship at 9 and 11, so we're continuing with that. So if you can join us at one of those two services, we would love to have you there. Make sure to use Sign Up Genius if you can. This may be a good time to sign up on the device that you're on. However, you're joining us tonight. We would really appreciate that. And then Bible class in between those two services at 10 o'clock. That gives us some time to uh, mix the two groups. We can all see each other during class and before and after. And as you know, I love heading outside <laughs> to do that fellowship outside, get a breath of fresh air. And uh, where we're able to take the mask off and be outdoors together between those two services. So hope to see you this coming Sunday at 9 and 11. Or maybe we should say 9 or 11. I suppose if you want to go to both services, uh, that would be fine. Uh, but anyway, looking forward to seeing you this coming Sunday, and guests are always welcome. Uh, tonight we are continuing with our study of the book of Acts. It is the book of gospel action written by Luke, who is described in Colossians chapter 4 by Paul as being the beloved physician. And so he's some kind of a medical doctor in the ancient world. Uh, he is a historian. He does writing. He does research. So he writes the book of Luke and also the book of Acts. And these are the Acts of Jesus, basically, we would say, in the book of Acts, followed by the Acts of the Apostles, or as I just mentioned, the book of gospel action, as it is translated from the Chinese Bible, as I mentioned when we started this study a few months ago. Uh, he's writing to a man by the name of Theophilus, maybe a government official, because he's referred to as most excellent Theophilus, and he's giving him a history of the church. And that's what we've been looking at over a number of weeks now, and it focuses primarily on the ministry of Peter in roughly the first one-third of the book, and then picking up with Paul for the remainder of the book of Acts. Uh, tonight, as I said, we're partway through chapter 19. By way of very brief review, we've been looking at the ABCs of Acts. I've been keeping that on the screen over there on the right-hand side. But in chapter 1, we had the ascension, then the beginning of the church, the man who was carried and cured in chapter 3, the determined disciples in chapter 4, in chapter 5, the empty jail, in chapter 6, the first deacons, always with a question mark behind it there. Uh, in chapter 7, Stephen, the great hero, in Acts 8, how can I, a question asked by the Ethiopian officer. In chapter 9, I am Jesus. In chapter 10, the journey to Joppa. In chapter 11, we had a reminder that the kingdom now includes Gentiles. In chapter 12, we had Peter liberated again. In chapter 13, we had missionaries sent out. In chapter 14, Paul and Barnabas had to convince the crowds that they were not gods but men. In chapter 15, we had the reminder that the old law is not binding. In chapter 16, the Philippian jailer converted. In chapter 17, we had questions answered in Athens, with Paul preaching on the Areopagus in Athens. In chapter 18, we had reasoning with a preacher as Priscilla and Aquila pulled Apollos aside to explain to him the way of God more accurately. Uh, we didn't introduce it last week, as I remember, but we should have. But the summary of chapter 19 is saving our religious friends. Saving our religious friends. And the first example of that was Paul discussing baptism with those 12 men in Ephesus, and then basically rebaptizing them correctly. And we discussed the term rebaptism, how it's not really accurate, because really they were being baptized correctly for the very first time in Acts chapter 19, but we use that accommodatively. That's the way most people would look at that. If somebody's been baptized as a baby, perhaps, or perhaps uh, baptized for the wrong reason or, or something like that, they would be seen as being rebaptized. And so they thought they were saved, but that doesn't mean they were actually saved. And so it's, um, you know, saving our religious friends. Religion is not uh, all that there is. Just because somebody is religious uh, doesn't necessarily mean that they are right with God. And we're going to see another example of this in the second half of Acts chapter 19. Uh, by way of review, we're on Paul's third missionary journey. And Paul is now in Ephesus. Ephesus is right there in the middle of this map. It was a, a port city at that time. Since that time, uh, the land, the, the river uh, sediment has filled in. And ancient Ephesus, those ruins are now actually a couple miles away from the sea, as I remember it, uh, from studying this previously. But uh, nevertheless, Ephesus is right there in the middle of this map. So this kind of shows us where we are on Paul's third missionary journey. 
And if you're following along on the study sheet and the major events of the life of Paul, that's by Dr. Dow Flatt. I've once again uh, grayed everything out but the third missionary journey. And hopefully that makes it clear that the third journey takes place from roughly 52 to 57 AD. It involves Paul, Titus, and Luke. Ephesus is one of the main stops, as you can see on here. And on this journey, he writes the books of 1st and 2nd Corinthians, the book of Romans, and perhaps the book of Galatians, depending on when we believe that book was written. So he's now rebaptized these 12 men at Ephesus, and so we pick up tonight with Acts 19, verse 11. So still in Ephesus, we are in Acts 19, verses 11 through 17. Acts 19, 11 through 17. God was performing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul so that handkerchiefs or aprons were even carried from his body to the sick, and the diseases left them and the evil spirits went out. But also some of the Jewish exorcists who went from place to place attempted to name over those who had the evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, I adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preaches. Seven sons of one Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. And the evil spirit answered and said to them, I recognize Jesus, and I know about Paul, but who are you? And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them and subdued all of them and overpowered them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. This became known to all, both Jews and Greeks who lived in Ephesus, and fear fell upon them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was being magnified. In verses 11 and 12, uh, Paul is healing people. It sounds very close to what Jesus was doing. We see some similarities between Paul and the Lord here. Uh, we might think, for example, of the woman with the constant flow of blood who decided to touch just the fringe of Jesus' cloak. Remember that? And so it wasn't always a matter of Jesus uh, touching somebody or healing them in some direct way, but there was this idea that if you just touch the, the hem of his garment, I think the King James says. In fact, that's how I found that verse. I just typed it in quickly. I couldn't remember anything except for the uh, King James. But the hem of his garment or the fringe of his cloak, as uh, most translations these days say. So it, uh, it wasn't a walk up to somebody and declare them healed kind of situation, but this was more of a case of Paul himself almost seeming as if he were a source of the healing, even indirectly. So a piece of cloth or an apron, for example, would touch Paul, and then they would take that to somebody who was sick or demon-possessed, and they would be healed even without Paul being there in person. Starting in verse 13, some Jewish exorcists try to get in on the excitement, so they try to uh, make something of this. They seem to be men who maybe went around making a, a living doing this, uh, maybe faking it in some way. We aren't given any details here. We can only imagine. Uh, but what we do know is that they try using the name of Jesus. Uh, in a sense, they're taking the Lord's name in vain, aren't they? They aren't really working for Jesus, but they use his name in this process, and they tie it to Paul. And so they're trying to get in on the action. And it doesn't go too well, does it? And I saw one commentary earlier today where they compared Jesus to casting multiple demons out of multiple people. And they contrast that uh, with one demon casting out multiple men. <laughs> and so it's an interesting way of flipping that around here. So the evil spirit says, I recognize Jesus. I know about Paul. But who are you? And the man possessed by this spirit beats these men up, I think we would say, very accurately, forcing them to run for their lives. And they run away naked and wounded. Um, this demon-possessed man tears their clothing off. So it's not just a matter of hurting them, but uh, embarrassing them publicly. Uh, by the way, when Dr. Luke uses the word that we translate as wounded at the end of verse 16, he actually uses a word that is the basis of our English word trauma. And so it is the Greek word that we would recognize if we saw it. It would be the word for trauma. So literally, uh, these men were traumatized by what happens here. And this reminds us that even evil spirits or demons believe in God. And we need to throw that in here. We learned this again over in James 2.19, where James is discussing the relationship between faith and works. And he says, you believe that God is one. 
uh, you do well. Or as we would say, good for you. Great. It's great if you believe in God. But then he also adds, the demons also believe and they shudder or they tremble. And so he's making the point that faith without works is dead. Even demons have faith. And we see a reminder of that right here in Acts chapter 19. The demon inside this man uh, absolutely believes in God and is even somewhat familiar with the Apostle Paul. In response to this beating, in response to being traumatized, uh, the people are terrified. But they don't seem to be too terrified of the demon, at least the way I read this. Instead, they really be, seem to be terrified of Jesus, at least in a good way. So the fear of the Lord is upon them. So word about this beating and everything that happened connected with it gets out, and they end up praising the Lord Jesus because of it. So let's continue then with Acts 19, verses 18 through 20. Acts 19, verses 18 through 20. Many also of those who had believed kept coming, confessing and disclosing their practices. And many of those who, had, who practiced magic brought their books together and began burning them in the sight of everyone. And they counted up the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord was growing mightily and prevailing. And to me, at least, this seems to be at least somewhat tied to the seven sons of Sceva. So we've got these uh, men who were doing some weird stuff, trying to cast out demons without proper authority from the Lord. And then suddenly, right here next to that last paragraph, we have these other people who are practicing magic. And so I kind of tie these together partway because of the word also in verse 18. So these things seem to be tied together, at least in my mind, and it seems that the context would uh, verify that. And with these other people, those who were practicing magic, they were confessing and they were disclosing what they were doing. And I think most of us understand, just based on the, uh, the etymology, the history, the background of the word, to confess is to say the same thing along with somebody. So to say the same thing as somebody. And in this case, they are agreeing with Paul. Their confession is they are agreeing with Paul. They're ultimately agreeing with God. God says it is wrong to do these things. And these people are now saying, Yes, we say the same thing. Those things that we are doing, those are wrong. We agree with God. We agree with Paul on this. And so I would say this just to point out that when we confess sin today, we are admitting what we are doing. We are agreeing with God that what we are doing is in fact a sin. But they don't stop with confession, do they? That's not all there is to it. They don't say, well, yep, I did that. That's, that's a bad thing. I'm sorry. That's not where it stops. Beyond agreeing with God, they also take the next logical step, don't they? They start burning their books. And uh, one of the commentaries was making a point out of the, uh, the way that Paul words this here grammatically. It's not a one-time burning of a book, but they began burning their books. This was a process. It was ongoing. Not one big spectacular bonfire, which it might have been, but it was in fact that plus an ongoing type situation. So they take their books of magic, their recipes, we might say, and they burn them in public. And Luke makes a note here that the price of these books was equal to 50,000 pieces of silver. And uh, I mean, we could try to do the math here and look up what was a piece of silver, what's silver worth today, that kind of thing, do the multiplication. But um, it depends on what day you're doing this calculation with the price of precious metals and all that like that. Some have said that this would have been in the tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, or even up into the millions of dollars in today's economy. The point is, it was a huge sum of money that these books were worth. Uh, a few thought questions, starting with this one. If the books were so valuable, why didn't these magicians or former magicians just go ahead and sell them? Uh, certainly, they could have used the money. They could have used the money to send Paul on some journeys. They could have fed the poor and just on and on and on. That 50,000 pieces of silver, a lot could be done with that. So why not have a garage sale? Well, I think we understand what they understood. The books were evil. And so this was a part of their past. They were making a clean break with that. And so they destroyed them completely. They did not want these uh, to get in the hands of anybody else. And I uh, just read some things earlier today just confirming that the archaeologists have seen that Ephesus is a 
a source of a lot of this uh, sorcery, if we want to put those two words to close together like that. But uh, they found a lot of ancient uh, uh, documents with recipes and incantations and that kind of thing in this area. So these men, though, instead of selling, instead of passing it along, they just destroy all of this stuff completely. Uh, I would also note they do this publicly. They could have very easily done this privately, right, on their own. Uh, having their own little fire separately, burning a book here and there as they cook a meal or, or whatever. But instead, they make a public statement, don't they? they? They come out in public, very publicly. They make a break from their past. And they do this not just for their own benefit, I believe, but I believe also for the benefit of others. In other words, they're, they're saying to everybody who knew them, everybody who knows them currently, uh, we are not going back. You previously came to me to do this weird stuff for you. I'm not doing that anymore. I'm a different person. And we're going in a new and much better direction. I would also make another observation from time to time. Uh, somebody will have some kind of a protest where they will uh, burn something publicly. I think uh, you may remember this. I think it was in Florida a number of years ago when some kind of so-called pastor uh, sponsored a public event where he burned a Koran, uh, the Islamic uh, holy book, we might say. I don't know if you remember that. I mean, maybe shortly after 9-11, something like that. And he was mad and, you know, we're going to go, we're going to light this thing on fire and all kinds of controversy surrounding that. And uh, But what's the difference between burning a Koran and what happens here in Acts chapter 19? Uh, is this the same or is it different? And, and to me, it really gets back to who's doing it. In Acts 19, these people were not burning other people's books of magic, were they? They weren't protesting magic in general in some generic way. But these were their own personal magic books. And this was not so much of a protest um, of somebody else's faith as it was of their own magic, their own repentance. So this is a demonstration of their own personal change. So if somebody wants to uh, try to use this passage to try to justify hurting somebody else by burning something in protest. That does not really seem to be what's going on here. Let's just remember who it is who's doing the burning. So I'm just saying if somebody uses this by taking this out of context, uh, as with most weird doctrines that seem to be based on the Bible, we can usually uh, eliminate most of those simply by reading a few verses before and after it and try to get some of the big picture here. So these are people who are burning their own books. They're not burning um, some other document protesting what somebody else is doing. This is personal. Uh, so what might be a modern day equivalent? Well, just the first thing that came to my mind, I hate to beat on this, but uh, the first thing that came to my mind uh, was maybe somebody addicted to alcohol pouring his or her alcohol down the drain. And it's just a simple illustration. And so it's not me dumping out somebody else's alcohol, but it's the person who drinks making that decision. And I hope that makes sense. That's To me, in my mind, that seems to be uh, something parallel here. And maybe even doing it in a public way. I, I've done this in the past. I'm not going to do it now. And this is what I'm doing now to show that I'm serious. Even though it's expensive, even though it's valuable, even though it was important to me at one time. I'm making a clean break in uh, my life from the past. So I hope we notice the difference there. Uh, the result of this demonstration in verse 20 is that the word of Lord can, uh, word of the Lord continues to grow mightily and to prevail. So this has an impact on people. So now it's not just Paul preaching and teaching, but it's the reaction um, that is getting another reaction from others. And the gospel continues to spread. Let's continue then with Acts 19. Uh, verses 21 through 27, Acts 19, 21 through 27. Now, after these things were finished, Paul purposed in the spirit to go to Jerusalem after he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia, saying, After I've been there, I must also see Rome. And having sent into Macedonia two of those who ministered to him, Timothy and Erastus, he himself stayed in Asia for a while. About that time, there occurred no small disturbance concerning the way, for a man named Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver shrines of Artemis, was bringing no little business to the craftsmen. These he gathered together with the workmen of similar trades and said, Men, you know that our prosperity depends upon this business. You see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a considerable number of people 
saying that gods made with hands are no gods at all. Not only is there danger that this trade of ours falls into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis be regarded as worthless, and that she whom all of Asia and the world worship will even be dethroned from her magnificence. In verses 21 and 22, with input from the Holy Spirit, Paul decides to travel through Greece on his way back to Jerusalem. So he, this is in his own mind. This is what he wants to do in the future. He also wants to go to Rome at some point. But in the meantime, he sends two co-workers, Timothy and Erastus. He sends them on ahead to Macedonia. These men seem to be responsible for preparing the way, uh, making arrangements, checking in with the church, getting things ready in that way, and so on. Uh, but Paul, though, stays in Asia for a while, in and around Ephesus, apparently. In the rest of this paragraph, we have a huge disturbance, really a riot in Ephesus. As Paul continues to preach, Luke tells us that a man by the name of Demetrius, a silversmith, gets his fellow silversmiths riled up. And I would just point out here, it's not because Paul took a little idol of, of Artemis and burned it. This is not that. Remember, kind of comparing that to what happened in the last paragraph. That's not what's going on here. Paul is just preaching. And as Paul continues to preach, uh, Demetrius, a silversmith, comes on the scene. He gets his fellow silversmiths all excited about this. Uh, they are described as craftsmen at the end of verse 24. And I thought it was interesting that word that Luke uses here is the basis of our English word technician. And so these are silver idol technicians. So this is what they did for a living. They made these little silver idols. And these craftsmen had been making uh, boatloads of money selling these little silver sh uh, shrines of Artemis. So people would come from all over the world to come to Ephesus to worship the temple, uh, worship in the temple, worshiping Artemis there. And these men would sell these little idols to the tourists. I'm thinking of... Uh, traveling to see family over in Germany a number of years ago and uh, taking that high-speed train over to Paris for a couple days. And, of course, you got to see the Eiffel Tower. And if you've been there, uh, down at the base of the tower, just a, an amazing experience looking up at the huge steel beams and all that. But what, what, what happens there? You're approached by dozens of people trying to sell you these little trinkets, little Christmas ornaments or keychains or whatever, and they'll barter, and you know, four for $10, and you go back and forth and make a deal, and you buy a couple, that kind of thing. That seems to be what's going on here. And they're making a lot of money on this. People come from all over to do this. So in verse 25, Demetrius gets these men of similar trades together. Uh, some have referred to this as the silversmith's union. And uh, I don't have a problem referring to it in that way. So, I mean, we've got workmen of the same trade who have joined together to protect their income. That seems to be pretty much what's going on here, a, a guild of some kind. Uh, Demetrius gets them together. He makes his pitch. He seems to be like a, a leader, a coordinator of some kind. Uh, basically, this Paul guy is threatening our livelihood here. And if we don't do something, our et entire economy here in Ephesus, it will completely fall apart. And it's not just Ephesus, it's all over Asia Minor. This, this Paul guy is getting around and people are believing his message. And he keeps saying that gods made with hands are not real gods. Well, that's a, that's a true statement, isn't it? That's kind of hard to argue with. Um, but he's getting his co-workers, his uh, fellow tradespeople excited about this and turned against Paul and riled up. And so we'll be disgraced if this happens. If he's allowed to continue, uh, people will start to understand this themselves, that gods made with hands are no gods at all. So this is going to spread. And Artemis and her temple will be considered worthless. And that's not good for the bottom line. So in this man's eyes, Paul's preaching is having an impact. That's one way of looking at this from a positive point of view. Of course, it's bad for Demetrius and his business model or whatever, um, but it's a good reminder for us that Paul's preaching definitely is uh, making some uh, progress here. Uh, this brings us to what happens next, so we'll continue with Acts 19, 28 through 32. Acts 19, verses 28 through 32. When they heard this and were filled with rage, they began crying out, saying, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! The city was filled with the confusion, and they rushed with one accord into the theater, dragging along Gaius and Aristarchus, Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia. And when Paul wanted to go into the assembly, the disciples would not let him. Also, some of the Asiarchs, who were friends of his, sent to him and repeatedly urged him 
not to venture into the theater. So then some were shouting one thing, and some another, for the assembly was in confusion, and the majority did not know for what reason they had come together. In the first part here, we have this mob. A Really, a riot has formed at this point. It's right on the verge of it at this point. Uh, Demetrius is continuing to get the crowd fired up. They've got the artisans together, the, the silversmith technicians, and they're shouting and they're screaming in unison, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And so they're not really dealing with Paul's argument. They're not dealing with his words. They're not dealing with his message. But they're, they're screaming what they believe very falsely to be true. It's almost like the uh, men who were determined to kill Stephen. Remember, they, they covered their ears and they were screaming. So they weren't listening to reason. There was no listening to logic here. They make their way into the theater. They drag along Gaius and Aristarchus, two of Paul's traveling companions from over in Macedonia. Uh, they know these men have been with Paul, so they just kind of drag them in there. Uh, they're looking for some mob justice. So Paul's preaching is impacting their bottom line. They're mad about it. Paul's preaching is disrespecting Artemis, and they want it to stop. Uh, by the way, this theater is still with us. Archaeologists did most of the excavating back in the mid-1800s. They've done some more on and off since then. Uh, but it's all exposed now, and a little bit of it down there looks like the theater floor has been um, kind of renewed or restored. And they estimate that this would have held somewhere between 17 to 25,000 spectators. So I think we're only looking at a little more than half of it. I think that little path going up from the left where the woman is standing there is pretty much halfway. So we're kind of looking at uh, the, the right side of this huge theater. So this whole thing, they say, again, would have held somewhere between 17 to 25,000 people. So to put this in perspective, it held at least as many as the Kohl Center, okay? and probably several thousand more. I think configured for basketball, doesn't the Cole Center hold just over 17,000? So this facility right here would hold somewhere between 17 to 25,000 people. That's more than Pfizer Forum, which I think I was kind of surprised that only holds about as many as the Cole Center. But uh, nevertheless, it is a, a huge facility, one of the largest theaters like it in the ancient world. Uh, but this is almost certainly the exact place that Luke mentions. And... Uh, the angry mob grabs these two men, Gaius and Aristarchus, drags them into the theater. I would assume they're down there on that uh, level sp spot down there at the bottom on the stage. And everybody in here is just shouting and screaming, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians, just over and over and over again. Well, what does Paul do? Paul wants to go, doesn't he? Paul wants to jump into this. Uh, in his mind... <laughs> This is a great opportunity. I could preach the gospel. Uh, 25,000 Ephesians. They're, they're all assembled in one place. This is better than the synagogue, perhaps. But in verse 30, the disciples won't let him. Um, I pick, in my mind, I picture them almost physically restraining. Kind of hold him back. Don't let him go. He really wants to go. In verse 31, some of his friends in government also urge him not to go into the theater. And ultimately, that's probably a wise move, right? Uh, we remember Jesus warning about casting pearls before swine. These people are not listening to rational arguments at this point. It would do no good. And so I think on this occasion, it's almost certainly good that Paul listened to the people around him instead of being uh, stubborn in a good way, as he sometimes was. In verse 32, Luke explains what's going on at the theater. Some of you know my parents were both uh, school teachers, public school teachers in a previous life. Uh, my mom taught third grade until I came along. And uh, my dad taught high school speech in English for about 10 years in northern Illinois. And I remember, um, well, he was uh, the representative for his uh, the teachers' union at his high school. So he was kind of representing the other teachers at that school. And so he had to attend a lot of school board meetings. And I remember him saying a number of times in the past that verse 32 sounds a lot like some of the school board meetings that he's attended through the years. Some were shouting one thing and some another, for the assembly was in confusion and the majority did not know for what reason they had come together. <laughs> of course, today, school board meetings are, are calm and peaceful now, aren't they? Calm and peaceful, all rational discussion. Not exactly, of course. 2,000 years later, and we still have issues, don't we, when large groups of people come together. It's been on the news even over the last couple weeks here, even school board meetings. Um, by the way, in verse 32, when the New American Standard uses the word assembly to describe this group, he uses the same word that is sometimes translated as 
church and accurately so so i'm just saying uh, this is the same word translated church church assembly group that kind of thing and so this is a good reminder that the word church is not actually a very churchy word um, church in english obviously we hear the word church and we think church church we think of people worshiping together in a building a lot of people think of the building um, but thankfully some of the more recent translations i think have come back to translating this word as assembly or congregation that would be the more accurate term to be used here instead of making it a religious word um, and trying to distinguish that so whether referring to a riot in Ephesus or a group of God's people assembling together in Corinth or in Jerusalem, the word that Luke uses here refers to a group of people who have been called out or called together for some reason. And I hope that makes sense. It is the same word. And here in Acts 19, these people are angry. And unfortunately, they have no idea what they're angry about. They're just angry. So everybody else is angry. I think I'll be angry too. It's, it's a good reason, a good day to have a riot. So let's continue with the last paragraph, Acts 19, verses 33 through 41. Acts 19, 33 through 41. Some of the crowd concluded it was Alexander, since the Jews had put him forward. And having motioned with his hand, Alexander was intending to make a defense to the assembly. But when they recognized that he was a Jew, a single outcry arose from them all as they shouted for about two hours, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. After quieting the crowd, the town clerk said, Men of Ephesus, what man is there after all who does not know that the city of the Ephesians is guardian of the temple of the great Artemis and of the image which fell down from heaven? So since these things are, since these are undeniable facts, you ought to keep calm and do nothing rash. For you have brought these men here who are neither robbers of temples nor blasphemers of our goddess. So then, if Demetrius and the craftsmen who are with him have a complaint against any man, the courts are in session and proconsuls are available. Let them bring charges against one another. But if you want anything beyond this, it shall be settled in the lawful assembly. For indeed, we are in danger of being accused of a riot in connection with today's events since there is no real cause for it, and in this connection, we will be unable to account for this disorderly gathering. After saying this, he dismissed the assembly. In verses 33 and 34, they get the wrong guy. So the Jews throw Alexander out there, um, and we don't know why. It's kind of a strange thing. Uh, some commentaries have speculated that maybe the Jews wanted to put forth a spokesman to say, hey, this isn't us. <laughs> You know, you want Paul, you don't, you don't want us, you, you want the, the Christian type people. Maybe that's a possibility, but uh, he tries to speak up and this isn't what the people want. So uh, they get back to shouting. And so they shout for two hours, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. In the middle of this passage, the town clerk speaks up and basically tries to calm everybody down, kind of a voice of reason here. And his argument is everybody knows Artemis is a legit god. Um, everybody knows we're here to protect her, so let's make sure we don't do anything rash. And um, there's that reference to her, the image falling down from heaven. I think some of the speculation is there was a meteorite that fell, and they thought, ooh, this is a sign from the gods, and that ended up, that's kind of how Artemis got started. We don't have that detail here, but this does seem to go along with that. But the clerk's concern, as being kind of the guy in charge, his concern is that they have dragged these people out into the mob when they're not really guilty. Of anything. In other words, we have the wrong people here. And I think as a leader, he understands that's that's a downside when this kind of thing happens, that uh, bad decisions are made. We're not thinking clearly, so slow it down a little bit. And so because of this, the clerk suggests handling the situation legally in the courts. You know, the courthouse is open, walk down there, bring your lawsuit, go, go ahead, do that, do, but do it in some orderly manner. Um, otherwise, if they continue, the clerk is concerned that the Romans, they're going to step in and they're going to bring the hammer down. A uh, Roman custom, of course, was to pretty much let people govern themselves. And they would only step in if there was a problem. And this was about to be a problem. And the Ephesians were dangerously close to losing their ability to self-govern. I was doing some more reading this week that pointed out that it was often, if it did get out of control, it was the town's leaders who would be executed and replaced as Rome comes in with a new and improved plan to restore the peace. And so this guy's life is on the line. He steps in and he says, let's, let's not do it like this. If you've got a problem, take it to the courts. And with this, the town clerk dismisses the assembly. 
Well, this brings us to the end of Acts 19. It also brings us to the end of Paul's three years in Ephesus. Next week, we move into chapter 20. And we'll see that Paul moves along and crosses over toward Macedonia. So that's kind of where we're heading next week. Uh, remember, in the ABCs of Acts, chapter 19 is summarized by the phrase, saving our religious friends. Several years ago, uh, somebody suggested silversmiths, silver shrines. Silversmiths, silver shrines. And that is a very good, honorable attempt. It is a valiant effort. Um, in my mind, it's a little too hard to say, isn't it? Uh, silversmiths, silver shrines. That would uh, slow us down sig significantly. But if you prefer silversmiths, silver shrines, if that is easier for you to remember, then go for it. But uh, to me, saving our religious friends, actually, it hits a few of the situations in chapter 19. So just because you're religious or think you are, doesn't mean you are saved. And based on Paul's example in this chapter, we have an obligation to speak up, as he did with those who... Um, were improperly baptized, as he does with the magicians, as he does with those who worship Artemis. So it is possible to be very much religious, but very wrong at the same time. So saving our religious friends. There are times when those who are religious still need to be saved. And that's what we get out of Acts chapter 19. So this is a good place for us to take a break tonight. Paul is wrapping it up in Ephesus. He's getting ready to move along. Uh, thank you again for taking the time to study together tonight. I know your time is valuable. All of our time is valuable. And uh, hope you can be present for worship on Sunday, either at 9 or 11. And, and also join us for class in between at 10 as we study Second Peter. And let me know if you have anything that we need to be praying about, anything that needs to be updated in the bulletin. Uh, let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, you are the God above all other gods. We've seen that tonight in Acts. You are the creator of heaven and earth. You are the living God. Tonight, we're thankful for your book and we're thankful for your message of salvation. You, need, you have what we need. Thank you, Father, for saving us and thank you for making us a part of your plan to go into all the world preaching and teaching the good news. In Jesus, we pray. Amen.